Here we are in the final phases of the challenge in the last section of RS Logics 5000 or RS 5000 beginner, the very basics, the very introductory. The next step is to edit your rungs of logic as shown on roughly page 247, 248, something like that. So I'm going to pause, make the changes, and then come back. So you, you will see the changes instantly, but I'm not going to make you watch me drag instructions around on the screen. Just as a reminder though, looking at our routines, we were looking at production. That's what we've been looking at, the production routine. We have the lubrication routine. You remember this code from previous labs. And then we have the main routine, which is just the system enabled and then the JSRs to these th three routines down the bottom. The one that we're going to be focusing on now is the conveyors routine. And right now, if the system is enabled, if the carton, if something is blocking the photo eye at the beginning of those three conveyors, the conveyor motors run. So this is where we're going to be doing our edits. Okay, we're back now with our three conveyor motor rungs, if you will. In the manual, we have the logical statement of what you see in front of you. Let's read what conveyor one says. Conveyor one runs if. So this bit is set on in memory if, of course, we're going to leave out system enabled. We just assume that the system is enabled. If photo I1 is blocked, if the photo I at the entrance of conveyor one is blocked, we want the conveyor to run unless the conveyor is full. Conveyor one count has to be not done. If it's full, if it's done, then this will be false and the, the motor won't run. Also, if the photo eye is blocked and conveyor one is full, not full, full. So this will be true if it's not full, this will be true if it's full. However, if it's full, Conveyor 2 has to be running, otherwise we're not going to run Conveyor 1. Remember, we're not going to jam up cartons at the entrance of Conveyor 2. So looking through that again, the primary permissive or condition for motor Conveyor 1 is photo eye Conveyor 1 entrance has to be blocked to turn on Conveyor 1 motor. However, if it's not full, then we just turn on Conveyor 1. If it is full, we can't run conveyor 1 unless conveyor 2 is also running. This instruction is looking at the result of the logic in this rung. If this rung is true and conveyor 2 is running, then that will be true. If this is true, then we can run conveyor 1 regardless, whether it's full or not full. We can run conveyor 1 if conveyor 2 is running, which means that the cartons have some place to go. Obviously, conveyor 2 is not going to be running if it's full and conveyor 3 is not running. So if you follow the same logic and drop down one, we now have the full state of conveyor 1 to consider. Now, this bit right here is kind of a logical pivot. It depends on whether you want to fill up all three conveyors, one carton at a time, or you want to just buffer the first of the three conveyors. You see, we're not going to run conveyor two unless conveyor one is full, which means that we have to completely fill up one before we run two. That's in series here. That is anded with photo I being blocked at conveyor two entrance. Notice this does not consider that anything to do with photo I one. If there's a carton blocking the entrance of photo I2. So you have to ask yourself, how did it get there? It didn't just show up out of the blue from nowhere. Now, in the rung zero, photo I conveyor one entrance, we don't know where those cartons are coming from. Our system doesn't care. It probably rolls down a gravity conveyor and comes to rest against the nose of conveyor one, the entrance of conveyor one. All the more reason to have a debounce timer because if that carton rolls down a gravity conveyor and bounces a little, it could bobble in and out of that photo eye. We probably would tidy up this code right here 
with a debounce timer. Notice we have a debounce timer to handle the production counts, but we don't have here to keep the motor from pulsing. We'll just take it as it is though. Remember, we want to keep this simple. You can make it more complicated when we're done with this project, then by all means, you keep playing with it to your heart's content. We understand this, that a carton blocking photo eye at the entrance of conveyor two implies indirectly that conveyor one is running because conveyor one, one wouldn't run unless it was empty or conveyor two is running. But we're talking about getting conveyor two running. If conveyor one is running, it'll be because the motor of conveyor two is running. So in the case where this is full, conveyor one's not gonna run until conveyor two runs. But anyway, let's move on. There's a carton blocking the entrance of conveyor two and conveyor one is full. Now, if it's not full, then we don't want to take any off of conveyor one. Now, if this photo eye is being blocked, I don't know how conveyor one could not be full, but we, we put all of, all of the permissives and conditions in there to make it a clear logical statement. And if conveyor two is not done, meaning the count's not done, meaning it's not full, then we run conveyor two to pull a cart nine. And of course, the minute it clears, it stops. However, if conveyor two is full and conveyor three is running, which means there is some place for the cartons on conveyor two to go if we run conveyor two when it's full to pull another carton on to conveyor two. Likewise, when we get down here, if conveyor two is running and runs a carton up into the entrance of photo I for conveyor three at the entrance and conveyor two is full and three is not full, then we run motor conveyor three. Otherwise, if conveyor three is full, and this is false, if we have a downstream request, that would basically be the same as this condition of motor three running. In other words, this means there's some place to go. If downstream they're calling for a carton, then that means that their system is running, ready to pull the carton off of three onto their section of production. So that's how that code works. And you can read the logical statements, including the parentheses, the and and the nor and the nots, on roughly page 247, 248 or so. Then I had you add a rung of logic to your production routine. Basically, if you toggle this bit, and you have to toggle it with, from your keyboard, then it will reset all of these timers. I'm sorry, all of these counters. Now one thing I just noticed here, because when I toggle this, it should have went back off and I'm looking, then I say, well, Tim, you don't have, you're not online. So I go to communications, who active. So I forgot to download after I made all those changes, which didn't matter until this minute. So you see what happens with a reset. When we go back to the run mode, watch reset conveyor counts. See, it goes back off. Toggle it on. You never even really see it go on. It's self-extinguishing. So the next scan, when this is true, reset, 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 unlatch, or remember there's a true execution only for the unlatch, and that's to set reset conveyor counts off. So this is just another little way to be able to toggle a bit on and have it go back off by itself after it's completed what you needed. Explain how this run works and how to execute it. I just did that. Although we might not do this in the field, we are going to move the RTOs from the conveyor routine to the lubrication routine to, like, to make the logic more readable for the beginner. Now, I already did that. If we go back to conveyors here, you see they were gone when we started this discussion because I had already moved them. So if you remember, right after this, we, you turn this on and then we did the RTO. Well, if this is on, then that means this rung is true. And the true state passes through that instruction to the RTO. If we take and examine this bit on in memory, the motor conveyor, we can transfer it to the RTO. 
and I did that for the three loop schedules. Now, the next thing, and I'm just making this up as I go. I mean, I'm talking about when I write the manual, I sit down and I just start developing something. And then I'm always thinking, well, now what we, what can we do next to show some other facet or feature to enhance your learning experience? So I looked at this as well. Edit your lubrication routine to look as follows, which you did. And then, and you're looking at it right here, can you think of any way that you could combine some of the lubrication logic that is combining the first two rungs into one. And I show you how to do this. I'm going to do that right here. Basically, I am going to move these two instructions in front here because see this is conveyor one loop schedule, conveyor one loop schedule done. I can double click here, click there, and then control click. And I can drag this down to here. See? Click there delete and then double click here select that select that with a shift key held down so you got them both selected and drag them down to the instruction Mimi at the head of the rung delete double click select shift select so you got them both selected left mouse button down drag it over to this Mimi and release Select this rung, delete, finalize all edits. And that should be good. What might occur occasionally to render the loop cycle short? Well, we did mention that earlier. If we happen to stop the system, you know, hit, the, hit a stop button like stop system, it would stop everything. The, the rung would see these motors would go off you know we, we would just lose where we're at in our pulse because the run would go false so we want to bypass the motor so double click to put in the edit mode select branch around so if perchance the motor were to turn off we want to keep it on as long as we have the loop pulse going on. Take the conveyor one loop pulse. If this timer is running and somehow the motor gets turned off, the timer timing pulse ORD around the true on on the motor bit will keep the rung true until the timer times out and then the rung goes false. We would do that on each of our rungs. Grab the tag, drag it over here, double click, select, branch around, true fine, and drag conveyor three loop pulse over. Finalize all edits. And voila. There you go. And we can see the whole thing on one page. As a matter of fact, we can geezer it up. Whoop, too much. There you go. That's as far as we can geezer up for you to see everything. Now there isn't much more that you could do to... Well, you could combine the reset. We could make the three rungs just a little bit more convoluted. You see this done bit right here? We could branch around here. Branch around and move the reset and the done bit right here. But I, I don't know that it would make the code any more readable. Uh, however, it does make it more conclusive. So just for grins, let's do one. Put that in the edit mode. Click on that one. Pick a branch around. Now I could make a fool out of myself here and this not work. I'm going to... I don't like to see it wrapped around like that. It's difficult to look at. So I'm going to grab this and then shift select and then drag this up to here remember I'm not moving it I'm just taking a copy because that rung's not in edit mode okay, it would look something like that okay so then I'm going to to render this rung not workable I'm going to do this this is a very 
easy way to cheat. So I think you can see what I've done there. I'll explain it if you can't. So this says if the pulse is not done and it is done, then reset. Well, you know, they can't both be true, so we'll never reset loop one. So let's check it out here. To run motor one, we'll go to conveyors and we'll turn on the entrance to what oh, we need system enabled. And we need uh, conveyor one count is done. That's probably because we have zero in here for preset. We never put presets. So I'm going to go back and turn off that photo eye so this doesn't take off when I change this. Let's say three is full for all of these. Okay. And now back to conveyors. See, they are all ready to go. As soon as we see the entrance photo eye, conveyor one is running. If we go to lubrication, we've got a 12 second timeout. And when that's done, you see the pulse. Okay, and when this pulse was done, it reset this timer. See that worked. So we'll let it go again. Watch this gets 12 seconds. We have a two and a half second pulse on the lube and then it resets itself. And this is just going to keep running. Now let's say we turn off motor one during this two and a half seconds. Oh, I was a little slow. See it kept on going. Now let's do that again. So there's the motor one is running. We got to get the loop schedule going. And then we're going to turn off this motor by way of the photo eye once we're in this two and a half seconds. So I turned it off, see, but it keeps going. So the motor disappeared, it went off, but the timer timing pulse from this timer, not this one, this timer, keeps it going. I'm going to delete this rung. Now I think I'll leave this rung as is and leave these two as they are so you can see the difference. In case you want to study it, sit here and you can change your logic because this isn't in your manual. Okay, every time I go through these things, I see more, think of more. You know, there's more things I'd like to show, but there's just a limited amount of time. You just can't keep writing page after page on the same subject to cover every possible iteration. We edited our code to handle the timer timing bit to. Keep it going. Do not make those edits to combine each of the two lube rungs into one unless you are comfortable with the logic. This is your machine. You know, at this point, we're kind of running fast and loose. So somewhere in this last section, we were when we were doing part five of the challenge, we got a little looser and I started doing things different. And at this point, you're able to more than capable of making changes and doing it any way you want. Okay, save your project as challenge one final. So this would be the final state of your project. And there you are done with the lab exercise of this manual. However, we do have a couple pages to go talking about testing this challenge. Challenge one continued part five testing challenge one. On approximately page 252-253 thereabouts. If you do not follow, execute this sequence correctly, you will have to start over from the first step. I'm going to walk you through it. I won't do a perfect job because typically what happens is I get distracted by some point that I want to make and then I don't necessarily get back smoothly to the sequence. Understand this, to simulate a part arriving at the entrance to a conveyor, you turn the photo eye to the on state and it stays in that state until the conveyor motor energizes and pulls the part forward. When the conveyor has moved the part forward, it eventually clears the photo eye and the photo eye reverts to the off state. This means that you have to flip the switch or hold down the push button that represents the photo eye, you're going to have to turn it on and leave it on 
until you see the motor running then you can flip it back off or release the push button. In the manual I show the three conveyors, conveyor 1, 2, and 3 with local 1, O, data 1, 2, and 3 for the motors. And I have photo eyes 1, 2, 3, and 4, local 1, I for input, data 1, 2, 3, 4. At this point in the sequence, the counter for that conveyor will increment as having accepted it. That is a continuation of my previous statement about holding down the push button or leaving the switch on that represents the photo eye and leave it on until you see the motor running and then you can flip it back off, that is release the push button. At this point, the counter for that conveyor will increment as having accepted it. If the part is coming off of an upstream conveyor, that event will also need to decrement the counter for the conveyor from whence the part came. I, I don't know if you want to say upstream there, downstream, but if, if a part is leaving one conveyor and going upstream to another conveyor, then you count it on to the next one and count it off the one that it was on. We'll go over our I.O. here real quickly. In the manual, it shows two columns, inputs and outputs, input 0 through 5, system start push button, photo I conveyor 1 entrance, photo I conveyor 2 entrance, photo I conveyor 3 entrance, photo I conveyor 3 exit. And then input 5 we may or may not be using, depending on whether or not you used it for downstream request. I think I had you do that in the manual, but it wasn't necessary. You could always toggle it, you know, right from your keyboard, because we are really simulating this. And then, of course, for outputs, uh, output 0 isn't really used, but output 1, 2, and 3 are motors 1, 2, and 3. So the test sequence, toggle the reset conveyors bit to clear the counters. If we go to production, and of course, they are all, well, there's 3 in conveyor 1 there, so we'll toggle this and that clears all of the conveyors. Lower the preset on all of the debounce TON instructions to reduce your waiting time unless you would rather watch them accumulate for more fun, meaning that you have more time to think the longer you make these timers. Lower the presets on the counter data types to 3 for conveyor 1 and 2. The preset for conveyor 3 should be set at 1. That means that our preset for conveyor 3 set at 1 is that we're not going to do a complete buffer on conveyor 3. Because remember, you can buffer any number that you want from 1 to 3. 3 will fit on the conveyor, and you can have them pass through or buffer, and you can buffer 2 or 3. Open all the routines with exception of lubrication. Down here, I have lubrication open. I'm going to remove that, close that routine. So I have main routine, conveyors, and production. That doesn't mean you can't have lubrication down there. It's not going to hurt a thing. In case, I'm going to put it back down there. So it's main routine, conveyors, production, and lubrication. This down here has nothing to do with anything but display. It has nothing to do with the controller. This is just for you. Open all the routines with exception of lubrication. Arrange your display wide enough to accommodate any of the three routines in the window without the rungs ramping around and tall enough to accommodate all the rungs in any of the three routines. I think we're okay without moving around these menus up here like we've done in the past. Let's look, main routine, Conveyors, we can go a little bigger there. Production, I don't think we can go any bigger there. We'll give it a try. Oh, went to maze. Matter of fact, we'll just stretch this out a little wider here and see if we can go bigger. Yep, did not wrap around. Conveyors, we can go bigger. Lubrication, we can go bigger. So there, we have everything up nice and big. Now, if you're using a mobile app, you're still going to have a, a visual challenge to see all of this on your small screen. But give it a whirl anyway. Otherwise, use Sling or whatever that feature is on the smartphones. 
I know it's on my Kindle Fire HDX slingshot. I don't. I can't think of the name right now, but you can take and if you have a wireless TV, you can view it on your wireless TV. Some of this you may have to view on a bigger screen than your mobile app. For the sake of expediency, we are not going to spell out each tag name every instance where we refer to them. It will be Photo I1 instead of PE Conveyor 1 entrance. Okay, switch PE1 on and leave it on and select the conveyor's logic. Well, you might want to have a little piece of paper off to the side that duplicates the list on the previous page that showed input 0 through 5, output 0 through 3 and have them written out for easy reference. Switch on PE1, which is input 1, and leave it on. Now I'm going to go to conveyors. There's PE1, flip it on, leave it on. Okay, the conveyor's running. Now we can, we can leave it in this state because we really don't know how long the conveyor is or how long the carton is. Theoretically, if this carton was a foot long and the conveyor is traveling at one inch a minute, it's going to take 12 minutes to get the carton on the conveyor. Or the other way around, the conveyor is traveling at one inch a second and the carton is 10 foot long. As you can see, the conveyors themselves are virtual and they're fictitious. They aren't confined to any length or width or speed for this logic. Conveyor 1 is running. If we go to lubrication, what we're going to see is it keeps timing out and pulsing grease every 12 seconds. And we don't really need to ever look at this again. We know this works. So it's just working in the background. If we go to production, we see that the photo eye is still blocking conveyor 1. The debounce timer is timed out and now it's just waiting to clear what do I want to count up one? Are any of the conveyors running? Yes. Which? Conveyor 1. If you had not left PE1 on for an interval greater than the debounce, would the above answers be different? Yes, they would. Nothing would be running. Switch PE off and leave it off. Okay? So we just cleared the photo eye. See, we counted up one and you see that the conveyors aren't running. So at this point, if you wanted to flip your pages back a half a dozen or so to the diagram where we had steps one through eight, this would be step two. Carton is on conveyor one and has cleared the photo eye. So you might want to put a slip of paper in your manual for easy return to that diagram. If, if you need that. If you don't, well, don't worry about it. Okay, we were on page 253, 254. We switched PE1 off and we left it off. Did conveyor 1 counter increment to 1 when PE went to the off state? Yes, it did. Select the conveyor logic. Are any conveyors running? No. While observing both the production and conveyor routines at appropriate mo moments, you know, switching back and forth, switch PE on. Check conveyors running and then switch PE1 off and check the count increment. So we're looking at the conveyors now so we switch PE on again. Conveyors are running. We go over to production and we go off with a photo eye. See we count up with two. Go back to conveyors and the conveyors not running. Did any conveyors run? Yes. Which? Conveyor 1. Did any conveyors run? Yes. Which conveyor one? Did conveyor one counter increment to two when PE went to the off state? Yes, it did. So far, with each on state of photo I1, the conveyor should have been running, and when photo I1 went off, the conveyor stops and the counter increments. If this is not so, either the logic is not correct or the inputs were not sequenced correctly or you missed something that did occur. Right now we have, we'll go to production, we have a count of two on conveyor one, nothing on any of the rest of them. And none of the motors are running. And all the photo eyes are off. Switch PE1 on and leave it on. 
and select the conveyors logic. We're already there, so we flip it on. Okay, conveyor one is running. Go to production. Conveyor one is running. Switch P off and leave it off. Did any conveyors continue to run? No. Did the conveyor number one counter increment to three? Yes, it did. Are any of the conveyors full? Counter done bit is on. We would go to conveyors. Now this is one place that we can do it. I mean, if we go to production, um, we can see the done bit is on here for conveyor one. We can see it there, or we can go here and we can see that the conveyor one count done bit is on. How did you decide whether or not a conveyor was full? Well, that word decided when you designed it or just now when you looked at it? I guess the answer is both the same. You are counting cartons onto the conveyor and you set the full count at three. When the counter was done, it's full. In this next action, you're going to simulate a part arriving at the entrance of conveyor one by flipping on the switch that represents photo I1. And since conveyor one is full, conveyor two will have to energize to pull the part exiting conveyor one fully onto conveyor two, blocking photo I2, and running until both photo I1 and photo I2 are clear. Before we go to the next paragraph here, think of this. If conveyor one is full, which it is right now, with three cartons, nothing's going to move until another carton arrives at the entrance of conveyor one, which means that you're going to turn on input one first. That should energize conveyor one because conveyor two is not full. And when the carton gets the furthest downstream carton, the lead carton, gets to conveyor 2, it should turn that photo I on and start up 2. You're going to turn them on, photo I1 on, and then photo I2 on, but photo I1 will clear first. So photo, photo I1 on, photo I2 on, photo I1 off, photo I2 off. On, on, off, off. So they go on, 1, 2, and then they go off, 1, 2. Because the carton got here first, this one will go off first. Okay, We will operate the switches in this order. PE1 on, PE2 on, PE1 off, and then PE2 off. This simulates the parts blocking and clearing the photo eyes in that order. PE1, then PE2, then not PE1, and then not PE2. Think this through completely before you start. Visualize what you are doing. If you cannot visualize the process in your head without actually looking at it while you're programming, you will never make it as a controls engineer or a control system programmer. Now you might work as a junior controls engineer and stay at the beginning level in a cubicle and always be assisting somebody out on the shop floor and maintaining a mediocre existence but never growing so if you, if, if you don't visualize well, start practicing right now. Pick anything. Close your eyes and then picture all the details of it. Just keep exercising your imagination until it's a, a, a usable tool. If you cannot visualize the process with your eyes closed, you will not be able to automate it. If you have difficulty with this, start practicing now and continue practicing until you are proficient. Look over a complicated mechanical device. Turn your gaze away from it and imagine what you have seen. Keep doing that until you can visualize it completely. The next level of visualization is being able to walk around it and see it all in your mind, even miles away. Almost any process that I've ever worked on, for instance, right now it pops into my head one of the ones I worked on last year on Lake Pontchartrain outside of New Orleans. It was at the, I won't say the name of the company because it's a military contract, but they do marine and land vehicles. 
and I was working on the automated gantry welders for the US Navy hovercraft. They call it ship to shore connector. Massive, massive labyrinth of welded aluminum for the hull and then it's got a bladder that runs around the outside, got two jet engines on it. It's got pilot houses, it can haul tanks, Humvees, you name it. Right now in my mind, I can recall almost every single detail about that process. I mean, I can walk around, I can look at even irrelevant things like the, because it's welding, it's automated gas welding, there are welder's curtains um, around the sides of it on the gantry, so if you're standing to the side, you don't get the arc flash in your eyes. I can see those, I can see the scratches, I can see how poorly that they didn't really lay flat, you know, it's plastic. I can see the, and this was near the water, so there are always spiders. I can see the spider webs, I can see the little crabs run across the floor. I mean, <laughs> when you do this work long enough, you will be, and you intently look at something, now you have to look at it to remember it. You can't just throw your eyes in that direction and then close your eyes and remember all the details. You have to look at the details. So look it over good and then practice visualizing. Okay, this is a good spot to slow down and practice visualizing the process. You've got these three conveyors you have photo eyes. You need to go back to that prior page that showed the nine, well, eight, one through eight steps and then come back here, uh, That that's fine. This is your learning process. You can pause the video and go do that and come back. Okay, now we want to switch on PE1 and switch on PE2. So on with PE1, on with PE2. Now because conveyor one count was full, that turned on conveyor two. If this had not been full, Conveyor, there's no reason for conveyor two to come on. Just conveyor one to pull on a carton until it gets full, but it was full. So it turned on conveyor two. If we go to production, we see that both of these are in the debounced state, but nothing has changed here counts wise. So we go back to conveyors. Are any of the conveyors running? Yes, which conveyor one, conveyor two. Switch PE one off and then PE two. Now I'll go to production so we're going to switch off PE1, see it counted up, switch off PE2. And notice that you may have seen this go to 4 before this counted up and then counted it back down to 3. That's fine. So we have 3 on conveyor 1, it's still full, and 1 on conveyor 2. What are the values? Well. Are any of the conveyors running? Well, let's go back. They shouldn't be, no. Which none? What are the values in conveyor one and conveyor two accumulates? CE1 is three, CE2 is one. See, three, three, accumulate, one. Repeat the, the previous sequence, PE1 on, PE2 on. Look at the conveyor logic to note what is running, and then PE1 off, PE2 off. Okay, so we repeat these two steps. PE1 on, timed out, PE2, PE2 on, timed out, then PE1 off, PE2 off. Okay, see so now we still have three because a new one came to the entrance of conveyor one. So we have three in conveyor one and two on conveyor two. I forgot to go look at the motors, but we know they ran. Otherwise, well, we know that they ran because as long as conveyor one count is on and we're running conveyor two. Now notice what's interesting here. Let's do this again. And I'm probably going off sequence. Oh well, let's turn on conveyor one. Notice a carton arrives at conveyor one at the entrance, but does conveyor one come on? No. Why? Because there's no place for the cartons to go. It's full. So it sets there. At this point, we have conveyor one full and conveyor two full. Look at the conveyor one count done, conveyor two count done. But let's back up a minute and I'm going to artificially change the conveyor two count to one 
so there's only one on conveyor two and three on conveyor one that is full. Go back to conveyors here. Conveyor one is full, but con conveyor two is not full. Now there is a problem with this code. When I create this kind of stuff, I, I just go at it like I would sit at my desk. Later on, I find something that's not quite what I wanted. I edit the code to match. When I discovered that, I decided to leave it as it was and continue on and then discuss the problems with this code. In the manual, it went like this. We had you turn on photo I1 and then turn on photo I2. Now, notice that the motor didn't start running. When I turn on photo I2, then both motors run. So there's a little fly in the ointment there. We'll discuss that later, but we'll continue for right now so we match what we have in the manual. We turned them on, now let's turn them off one first then two then we went to production and I ask you what are the values for conveyor one conveyor two accumulates repeat the above steps look at the conveyor logic to note what is running and then PE one off PE two off so we do it again one on two on and then one off two off now we have three and three so now we have six cartons three on one three on two before we go to the next step, if conveyor 1 and conveyor 2 are full and another part arrives at the entrance of conveyor 1, where will the parts on conveyor 1 go and the parts on conveyor 2 as well? Conveyor 3 has a preset of 1. Once that is reached, con conveyor 3 does not run unless the manufacturing area is calling for parts or a carton downstream. To pass a carton onto conveyor 1, we need to transfer a carton onto conveyor two and transfer a cart onto conveyor three. For this to function correctly, the controller should see PE1 on, PE2 on, PE3 on to simulate the train of cartons moving across the three conveyors. Now we're gonna change this in a bit, but for right now we'll leave this as is. So I'll sw switch PE1, two, and three on in that order and leave them on and look at the logic. One, two, and three. So we look at conveyors we see all three conveyors are running. Now that's because there's not one on conveyor three, otherwise it would be done and we'd wait for a downstream request. Are any conveyors running? Yes. Why? Well, because all three photo eyes are blocked and conveyor three is not full. Really it's because conveyor three is not full. If it were full, then we couldn't run three. If we don't run three, we couldn't run two. And if we don't run two, we couldn't run one. Did the conveyors energize before or after you simulated the PEs being blocked by the cartons? You could get so distracted with the logic that you are not visualizing the process. The photo eyes will not see cartons unless they are moving. Turn off the photo eyes in reverse order that you turn them on. Three, then two, then one. So three, then two, then one. Are any conveyors running? No. Why? Well, because now the photo eyes are blocked, there's no cartons to move. Are any of the conveyors full? We can see the conveyor one and two is full. Let's go to production. And we see that conveyor three is full. See the done bit is on because we have a cum of one, preset of one, it's done. So first, let's have another carton arrive at the entrance of conveyor one without a downstream request. Make sure that the downstream request bit is in the off state. Conveyor, that's off. Right there, downstream request. Let's have another carton arrive at the entrance of conveyor one without a downstream request. Make sure that the downstream request bit is in the off state. That would be input five. Now that all three conveyors are full, what will happen when another arrives at PE1? Well, to simulate this, turn on PE1, leave it on and look at the conveyor routine. Of course, nothing is running because everyone's full, there's no place to go. What we have is a standoff. We have a part at the entrance of the conveyor buffer system. The system is full and manufacturing downstream is not calling for parts or objects. This is exactly what we want it to do. Wait for a request. When the request comes and conveyors start running, 
parts are going to move in front of PE2, PE3, and eventually as they keep traveling, clear PE1 onto conveyor 1, clear PE2, clear PE3, and so on, until they block and clear PE4. You will operate the switches in this order, PE1, 2, and 3 on in that order, and then PE4. Look at the conveyors to see which you're running. The conveyors running and clearing photo-wise will be in this order. One off, two off, three off, and then eventually four off. This simulates the parts blocking and clearing the photo-wise in that order. PE 1, 2, 3, 4, and then not PE 1, not 2, not 3, and not 4. Think this through carefully before you start. Visualize what you are doing. While observing the conveyor's routine, toggle the part request bit to the on state and leave it on. Okay, now there, um, it's on right now, that's bit five, so I'll turn that off. And I'm going to look at production. Three, three, and one. Our conveyors are all full. Done, done, and done. One, two, three. They're all done, they're all full. So now we turn on something at PE1, but nothing moves. We do a downstream request. It's going to call for cartons. So we're going to turn on PE2, three, and then eventually the downstream, the exit. So we go back to production. They're all running, they're all debounced, so we do them in the opposite direction. One, two, three, four. So see we're back to three, three, and one, and we have one that's gone off the end of the conveyor. Now it didn't work perfectly. There is a problem with this code. I kind of skimmed over it. If you saw it, excellent. You're ahead of the curve. You get an A, course is all done, go out and treat yourself to a good steak dinner or whatever flips your switch. Okay, there is a problem. Actually, there's several problems. If PE1 clears first, all the conveyors stop. This is your first chance to experience debug commissioning firsthand. Hint, we want each conveyor to continue running if its entrance PE is blocked. We don't have that right now. If we look at the conveyors, we want that motor to continue running along as long as this block, meaning if the circumstances were there to start the motor conveyor, we want it to continue until we've completely pulled the carton through the photo eye. When conveyor one is not a pro with conveyor one, it is not a problem. But what condition are we missing in the logic for two and three? What condition do we want to or around with it? You would be doing yourself a great service to repeat this entire sequence from step one and observing each change in the state of the logic. This is the essence of PLC programming, process visualization, and writing the logic while you are visualizing the flow in your head. Remember, you don't have the machine to run it on because the way this is set up, our little uh, virtual project, it's not going to work right when you get out there and download it onto the conveyors. And if you're thinking, oh, it should, why are we doing one that's not going to work right? Because I'll guarantee you, you will never write a program of any size, go out and download it into the controller and have everything be exactly right from the beginning, not making any edits or changes. If you do, please give yourself a week off and celebrate or something. I've never known anyone to have that happen. There's always something that you overlook. Now there is one caveat here. If you're burning up a lot of hours overthinking this, over analyzing, and doing factory acceptance testing on simple machines to make sure the logic is absolutely perfect before you download it, you're spending too much money. You'll never be able to compete with other companies that do like an 85, 90, 95% correct code, download it in the machine, careful not to break anything, and then tweak it as they go and tidy up whatever bits need to be tidied up. Did make some changes. I'm going to make those changes and then come back. Here's what we did to tidy up 
the problem. And I will run some cartons through here very quickly to show you that it's been dealt with. Notice what we did is we added photo I conveyor one entrance in parallel with photo I two and photo I three because we want a carton arriving at photo I one to trigger the whole sequence. I'm going to go to production and you can see I've got three, three, and one. They're full. And I could go through and do calling downstream. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn this off so it doesn't do it. I keep thinking that's an internal bit that's not. It's a switch, so it's turned off. And for production, I'm going to reset all the conveyor counts and go back to the conveyor motors. Now this becomes more sequence critical with your toggle switches or your push buttons. And because I don't have, well let me show you a, a way to be able to look somewhat at production and conveyors at the same time. So I'm going to go up to the top, I'm going to drag down a new rung, and I'm going to put in I could put the done bits to show they're full. Instead, I'll be more clever and put in compare. And I'll do equals. So I'm going to say, let's go look at how these are named production. Conveyor one count. Okay, back to conveyors. Conveyor one, drill down, count. Do the accumulate and we'll do the preset so we'll drag that down to here double click backspace three times preset this instruction says that the counter the cum equals the preset then this instruction would be true but we're not going to do any true false business here so I'm going to control C control V V Okay, so I'm going to change this to 2, change this to 2, change this to 3, change this to 3. And then after this, I'm going to do a no op. And unfortunately, I can't remember. Move, file miscellaneous. Let's drag this puppy out. So I can see is it special? It's something I never use, no op right there. So I want a no op. Right there, no operation. This rung doesn't do anything. True or false, it does nothing. No operation. Now you see what I have. I have the accumulate and the preset that I can look at. If I want to make this even more, have more clarity, I can put in a done bit. Change that to two. Change that to three. That's as wide as I can make it, so I'm going to have to ungeezer it just a little. And finalize all edits. Okay, now there's our three conveyor rungs, and here's the state of our account. So it's kind of like a little HMI. But let's do photo I, entrance one. See, there's nothing in the accumulate. I let go. Now you see over here, there's one. Hold it down till it times out. Two. Hold it down till it times out the debounce. Three. Now you see the done bit comes on. Okay. Now if I back this up to two, just to make a point, and if I push input one, see the motor does come on. Now conveyor two does come on too. You know why? Because I knocked the accumulate. I knocked the preset down to two, not the accumulate. 
and I didn't change the done bit, so I hosed all that. So I'm going to start over. I'll go back to production, reset the counts, and profusely apologize for doing the wrong thing. This wasn't in the manual. That's what happens when you run off doing stuff half cocked. <laughs> you don't rehearse it and look it over close. So let's try that again. We have zero cartons in the system. Everything's reset. So photo I1, motor one comes on. Counts up to one. The accumulates on the top. That's what messed me up. I changed this instead of the accumulate. Okay, times out, motor's running. Now we got two. Another carton arrives, times out, motor's running, moves it, clears the photo eye. Now the next time I do this, I'm going to have to not use the push push button, I'll have to use the toggle switch. So I turn on the toggle switch, there's a carton here. It starts motor two. The carton on one moves onto conveyor two, blocks that photo eye. Clears one, clears two. Okay, so now I got three and one. Let's do that again. Another carton arrives at one, two comes on, comes into photo eye two, clears one, clears two. Now you see I've got three and two. Another carton arrives at the entrance of one, both motors come on, one and two. Photo eye two is now blocked. One clears, then two clears. Now you see I have three and three. Both counts are done. Both conveyors are full. Next time, I'm going to turn on one. Now look, all three motors come on because conveyor three is not full. Then it moves into two, moves into three. Then one clears, two clears, three clears. So I'll see I have three, three, and one. And again, you may have noticed this went to four because we took our time counting on and off of the conveyors, but the end result is correct. Okay, at this point, if I turn on conveyor one, nothing happens. They're full, and we're not calling for, for a downstream request. I'm gonna turn on the downstream request, all the conveyors start to run. We have one blocking one already. We block two, then three, then eventually four. That's the exit. Then we clear one, clear two, clear three, clear four. And see we're back to three, three, and one. There you go folks. So the buffering system is driven primarily by cartons arriving at photo I1. Whether or not each conveyor is full, PE 2, 3, and 4 are used to count cartons on and off of each conveyor. Now this is one solution. Thank you for your patience and sticking to the instructions in this manual. Because we got a little loose here at the end. And if you need to go back and do the challenges again, revisit sections in the manual, that would be good. Okay, bonus challenge one. Change the tags for each of the photo eyes to a base tag. Create a new subroutine called factory acceptance test and the JSR in the main routine and write logic to simulate the sequence of photo eyes as each new object arrives at the entrance of the first conveyor. Use one push button to announce a new object and have PE1 clear the announcement. Have fun. I always do. If you need a hint on how to do that code, remember the code that we did where we simulated turning on switches and then having them self-extinguish. If, if you stick to this, if you if you start doing this bonus challenge, I'll guarantee you, you'll get it. I, I may do it myself and post it on YouTube. Thank you for watching.